You're tuned in to The Andrew Lawton Show. Happen to be in British Columbia right now, beautiful BC, and given that I haven't seen another human being that I'm not married to for, you know, the last year, I thought it would be a good opportunity to chat with a guest I was going to have on the show anyway this week, but it just so happens we are in the same general vicinity, and that is Angelo Isidoro, who you may know as the host of Cancel This, a very popular podcast on the post-millennial, but who ironically went through the cancel mob himself in recent weeks, and I'm very glad is willing to speak up about it. Now, this is particularly interesting because he has perspective at seeing this both as a cancelee but also as a journalist. So we'll talk about this with Angelo Isidoro here on The Andrew Lawton Show. Angelo, good to talk to you. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you for having me. I want to talk about this from a a couple of different perspectives, Angelo, because you went through something that you've covered a great many times in other people. And in a lot of ways, I, I think that makes your story more sympathetic because a lot of the times people who themselves have been part of cancel mobs will get canceled and it's very difficult for people to find sympathy for them whereas you've understood before going through what you went through that this was a problem for quite a while yeah and it's helped me be more analytical of it because it is a bizarre situation where i mean for the past four years i've been hosting speakers like jordan peterson and ben shapiro and now i'm doing this podcast and even my writing is all situated around cancel culture so it's very bizarre to have it happen to you, right? It, it, it's 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 strange, but it gave me a perspective that is very nuanced. Where I, as a journalist and as a as a writer, as someone who looks at this stuff, can analyze it from a perspective of this is how this animal works. This is how the mob works. This is what they do first. This is why they use that word. This is how it happens, and this is how they ruin your life. I have to say that reporting on it and speaking to people is very different from having it happen to you. It's obviously completely different, and that's sort of what frazzled me the most was, although I've realized and I've known that the cancel mob is malevolent, having it actually happen to you is a whole other story. It's it's kind of horrifying. Let's talk about what happened, because in a lot of perspectives, this may not have tripped a lot of people's radars nationwide. This was a a regional story to some extent, but for you, it it becomes your whole world, and, and we'll talk about that. You have been involved, as you've just mentioned, in various forms of political activism. You were sitting on the board of a municipal political party in Vancouver, which is a phenomenon that people outside of Vancouver might not understand as much, the the nonpartisan association. And there was a story that was presented as one about the NPA, but ended up becoming about you in a lot of ways, and a, a photograph of you making this gesture that I've always known in my life as being about nothing but the word okay. And I mean, that I'm going to get canceled for doing that in the, yeah, in the show. I was about to say that you, yeah, well, the, I have nothing to do with we'll this blur, guy. We will blur it out. We will blur it out in the final. But, but you did that. You were wearing a, a, a Make America Great Again hat. And, and this was presented as evidence that this organization you were with, with had, had gone far right. Ha, does that sum up at the very surface level the story? Yeah, it does. It, it's a strange story because it is dressed in a hyper-localized issue, which is the Nonpartisan Association. Out of everything I do, a volunteer position that is completely innocuous. I mean, I'm interested in housing. Mm-hmm. That's why I got involved in it. They use that as a vehicle to cancel me and I've since been essentially forced to resign from that position. So as you said, um, you know, this outlet took a picture of me four years ago when I was, you know, a first year university student and I was going to a protest happening in downtown Vancouver, which was a Trump Tower was opening and people were upset. So me and other college kids thought it would be, you know, silly and dumb to wear a Trump hat and go and mess with people. And of course, at that time in in February of 2017, that gesture, besides being known innocuously as okay, was also a silly mimicry of Trump, right? If you watch even SNL with Alec Baldwin playing Mm -hmm. Trump, Trump has always had really bizarre hand gestures. So that's what that was. Later on, it turned into something else, but they took that photo, sat on it for four years now, and waited until uh, you know this opportunity to release it under the context of, well, the Christchurch shooter used the same gesture. Um, January 6th just happened, the insurrection in the States. They wait for things to happen and then retroactively try to ruin your life. So 
that's what they did there. Um, again, they dressed it up as a municipal issue. So even the mayor of Vancouver got involved and released a statement under the city government. Yeah. So uh, it, it turned into this big hyper-localized issue, but it's a broader issue that relates to really one of the most egregious, and obviously I'm biased, but an egregious case of cancel culture because it's a total lie. It's a total fabrication. And, and that's, I'd say, at the crux of cancel culture, is you take a, a two-dimensional caricature of someone, which may or may not be true. It, it either captures someone's worst moment or it, it completely concocts a, a moment in an image, and it tries to apply that to every other facet of, of their life. And, and in your case, you actually have a body of work to speak of. And I, I think that's why that's so difficult, is that in the nearly four years since that photo, you have put on record what you stand for, what you believe in. And, and I've heard episodes that you've done. I've, I've had some exchanges with you. It doesn't fit. And, and if you were a blank slate and they didn't have anything else to judge you on but that photo, sure, maybe you could ask some questions. But that, I, I think, is what I find the worst about this, is that there's no understanding that people grow. There's no understanding that, hey, this snapshot in time might have represented something else. Yeah, I, I think it's more difficult for them because I've been so public mm -hmm. in my life. And a lot of that is intentional because when you are in politics, when you're writing about politics, you're just engaged. It's very important that you don't do this PR recommended thing of just be silent. Don't answer. Don't do it. Because at the end of the day, when you look at me, whether you're listening to me or you look at my face, I don't match what they're being accused, yeah. what they're accusing me of. Yeah, you, I don't look at you and see white supremacists. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And even if you if you listen to my content, like I'm a pretty moderate guy, so they intentionally ignore that to such a degree where, you know, when these outlets want to defame you, they're not acting in good faith. So whether you issue a statement or not. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really make a difference, you know, to one of the outlets, I issued a statement, I provided links explaining that this was essentially a hoax that was co-opted later and, and this, et cetera. And they intentionally ignore it because it doesn't fit their narrative. Because if that gesture doesn't mean anything, what's the story? How do we destroy this person's life, mm -hmm. right? They're, they have to build you up into a villain. And unfortunately, there are very few mediums where you have the opportunity to speak freely. Um, you know, True North is a great example of that, where it's, it's uncensored, not in the way that this is explicit, but in the way that nuance is applied to the conversation. So uh, I'm lucky in the sense that I have a, a modest following. Mm -hmm. I, again, I still find it bizarre that I was canceled when, you know, I, I quite frankly don't matter that much to be on the front cover of the paper. But I think I was turned into a, a political mascot. And... I'm somewhat lucky that I do have that following. Others aren't. There's a, I believe a, a laborer in California did the same gesture and I think he was just flicking a booger or something, but someone took a picture of him and he lost his job. Wow. Right? Wow. So when we talk about cancel culture, we get so into the weeds of, you know, Gina Carano or, or what's happening to that celebrity or this celebrity. But really, that's just a vacuum of what seems to be happening to normal everyday people now. For years, I've gotten messages from people saying, I support everything you do, but I can't be public about it. Or this happened to me and I don't know what to do. Or, you know, even with this, I had a lot of people say, like, this is nonsense and everything, but I obviously can't be public about it. And after a while, you begin to realize that we've essentially handed, you know, the keys to the culture to a very vocal minority the vast majority of people look at that gesture and they're like, you know, it's scuba diver, it means okay. If the waitress asks you how your food is, your mouth is full, you, you do that gesture. It means nothing. Mm -hmm. But the framing of it is, this is widely regarded as a white power symbol. Mm -hmm. And even that word widely, that, that is, it's all tactical. And I know it because I'm a journalist too. Like we know how the game works. So. Yeah, some, someone who doesn't know the implications of that who themselves, if you were to flash that sign to them on the street one day, uh, would have no idea there was anything potentially illicit about it. They would read that story and assume by the way it's framed that, oh, well, he must, I didn't know it was that, but he must have known. And, and, that's, and that's where it becomes. So you start imputing motive and the worst possible interpretation of what could be the most mundane of things. Yeah, well, and then of course you have situations like K Kennedy Stewart, the mayor of Vancouver, who probably doesn't know anything about 
culture wars. Or, or, or about anything, yeah, frankly. Or about but, anything, frankly. Yeah. I mean, he's been a disaster mayor. Yeah. And he releases a statement, again, under the city letterhead. Yeah. So the, the state is calling me a radical. He came after me in a statement. He doesn't name me explicitly, but he, you know, was very concerned about radicalism within, you know, this other party. And people need to realize there are repercussions when you th say things. I know we're all sitting at our keyboards and we think that, you know, this isn't real life. But when you say that about someone, it affects the other person's life. I mean, I've had to resign from this position. I've gotten death threats. I've gotten hate mail. Um, very recently, a family member of mine has had their workplace contacted and now they're under review. Wow. It, it, this is a problem because, again, I'm in a lucky position where I work in media. So I'm able to, I'm already on that battlefield. Well, you, yeah, you have a, a natural bounce back because you have a platform. A lot of the people that you've, you've even alluded to don't have that. I mean, for them being called some of the names that have been applied to you is just the end of any ambition and any hope they would have at, at doing anything. And you, you'd said something that I, I thought was very interesting there about the, the silent ally and the silent friend in this. And, and it's something that I've been through myself, which is why I, I think there's so something that needs to be said about this. It starts to reinforce your, in, if you responded the way I did when it happened to me, it starts to reinforce your toxicity in some ways because you start wondering, oh, well, if, if, so, if, if all these people are afraid, maybe it's true or may, maybe I am actually damaged. And, and you start to view dynamics through that lens. Yeah. Well, you get gas, it's gaslighting essentially yeah. because on one hand, part of you is it, you're so low that you're thankful that someone does yeah. validate and say you're a good person. Even if, even if they're only telling you and would never say exactly. it to anywhere, anyone else. Exactly. Yeah. But on the yeah. second hand, when you look at it, you're like, there's a problem here because everyone is saying that, but so few people are willing to say it publicly. Yeah. So what is it that we're all afraid of? I understand it's, it, it's scary. It's scary to have your, your employer contacted. It's scary to have people who are essentially obsessed with you to come after you and try to ruin your life. The Google results are there now. If you Google yeah. my name, white supremacist comes up. Well, that, but that, that is the dangerous part though, because in terms of the buzz and the trending topics, people move on. And, and in, in your case, it seemed like people moved on very quickly, but that doesn't make it go away for the person. And, and that's the big issue that I think cancel culture needs to address or needs to have addressed and, and by extension be obliterated in that regard is that, yeah, the, the trend moves on, the mob moves on, the horde moves on, but the carnage that they left behind is still there. And there is no remedy that we've built into society yet for that. No, and I think it's, it's intentional on the other side because what they do, again, there's, there's an ecology on the left, and I'm talking about the radical left. There's an ecology where you have different quote unquote journalists that build a narrative about someone and that narrative then enca encapsulates the Wikipedia article. Yeah. Because you have sources. Well, that source says that and that. And it's they the all, same as the widely regarded it's as. It's the widely it's, regarded. He is widely believed to be. Yes. yes. <laughs> widely believed to be yeah. by who? Three yeah. crazy people on Twitter, right? Yeah. So it's, it's, it's a tactic that is used to mislead the layman. The person, the person, the people that we speak to, right? The people who work nine to five, they get home. They don't have time to go through 10 hours of pages to see, oh, wow, this is a hoax. They actually lied about this person. This is a total, complete fabrication. They don't have time, right? They read what they see. They say, oh, widely regarded as a white power symbol. They're like, oh, I didn't think that, but they're saying that that's what it is. I mean, there's a reason why trust in the media is so low, right? It's not that you know, populist promoted fake news narratives or whatever, like there's clearly a problem here and you're affecting people's lives. And, and in this case, you know, I had to have a conversation with myself. What do I do here? Do I pack my bags and move to Alaska? Like what my, the government of my city is calling me a radical. Yeah. This outlet that ranks high on Google is calling me a radical. It's calling me something so abhorrent, something my ancestors fought against, something that I fight against and I have a body of work to show. Yeah. And you try to intellectualize it by being like, well, no, I can't be this because here's evidence and here's this. And you know, I'm, I'm not exactly, again, I've repeated this many times, but I'm not exactly Hitler's wet dream. So <laughs> I, 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 you try to apply logic yeah. to it. And what you realize is that they're, they know what they're doing. 
half these people know what they're doing. They're acting in bad faith to try to eliminate you from the media and the equation. But the other half are just unknowingly consuming it and being a Twitter mob. So I'm in a position now where, again, I had to choose whether to walk away or to fight, and I have to fight it. So that if that's what my life is now, if that's what my life will ever be, is trying to clear my name, what do you do? Because if you let it be, they get emboldened. We know that. We, these people celebrate when they cancel someone, when they got Gina fired from The Mandalorian. They see it as a moral, virtuous victory. And it's evil. Mm -hmm. And the only way to defeat it is to not let them keep winning. It, it's, it's just they keep getting emboldened and it happens over and over again. So it's not just about me. Yeah. It's about the next, you know, schmuck. You've talked about uh, legal action. And I'm wondering if you could elaborate on, on where you think the fight needs to be, because there do seem to be two camps. There's one side that says, you know what, we need to, you know, get into a street fight with them and file lawsuits and put them on defense. And then there's, I'd say, the more romantic notion that this is all something we need to have out in culture and we need to shift the debate and shift the narrative. And then there are probably some hybrid positions. But where do you, I'll ask it in two ways, actually. Where did you, before a month ago, view the importance of the fight and where do you view it now? I, I see it as a hybrid because there seems to be something inherent in the West which is a belief in a justice system, right? You believe someone wronged you, they took something from you, you we all are encapsulated in this, in this belief that righteousness works, that justice works. And it's very scary when you realize that that's not always the case. So I think on one hand, the legal aspect is there for a reason. You look at the uh, Covington School boy, the Nick Sandman, I believe his name is, who essentially had his life ruined mm -hmm. over wearing a hat and standing there. And he sued and he won. I think he won a ridiculous amount of money. Mm -hmm. So on a legal aspect, that sets a precedent that is very important that tells these radicals there are consequences to what you do. Not just cultural consequences, but real consequences. So on that end, you know, I am suing the mayor. I am suing this outlet. Can I sue everyone? Well, no, because I'm not, you know, it's unfortunate that parts of the right have made it extremely commonplace to just sue everyone you don't like, right? I mean, even Trump himself is just, I'm just going to sue you. The reality is that part of justifying yourself and clearing your name is saying, I am willing to die on this hill. I am going to die on this hill in court and I'm going to go all the way. Let's do a discovery. Let's do everything we have to do. So that's one aspect. But the other aspect is cultural, which is having discussions about this, which is reporting on it, which is talking about what it does to people's lives and how it doesn't just happen to the odd crazy person that is, well, he's crazy, he's radical, he'll get canceled, but it'll never come to me. Mm -hmm. I'm in the middle, right? I mean, we're at a point now where even some leftists are getting canceled, right? Like, it, it, it's come to a point where as a culture, we need to have a discussion in terms of what are the consequences of what we've done in the past. And furthermore, how do we interpret things? Because we talk about mistakes made in the past, how many of these cancellations were really mistakes? How many of these cancellations were just well-coordinated attacks? Because what is cancel mm -hmm. culture? The left says, well, can't you know, free speech, but not free from consequences. It's consequences culture. They, they've actually, to use the left's terms, they've appropriated right-wing rhetoric. On that, because that that was always what conservatives used to say of well, you know what, it's the marketplace of ideas. But they're not actually committed to that. They're only committed to that in that narrow way when it serves their interest to cancel. Yeah. Well, in this case, they're saying, oh, you know, so much for the free speech guy. You're yeah. Sue exactly. For well, exactly. It's like there are consequences to defaming someone, and that is part of the marketplace of ideas. Exactly. That, that, that there's a, an expectation of honesty. And if you aren't living up to that end of the bargain, that moral contract of honest speech, you can be sued for it. Exactly. So it's funny that they say, well, it's consequences culture. You did that. You deserve the consequences now. And it's, again, most of the time, sometimes people deserve to get canceled or whatever. You know, you look at Woody Allen, who's in the news right now. Yeah. But in this case, it is something that is manufactured by very few people who are intentionally trying to make the perception that everyone hates you. Twitter is not real life. No. If you go to 90% of the people on the street and do that gesture, they're going to say that means okay. 
if we talk about the hat for a moment, 75 million people voted for that hat. So it's not just a matter of having a discussion on how do we punish people retroactively for their past mistakes. It's how do we realize as a culture that a lot of the time they weren't mistakes. A lot of the time things that happened in the past were just not really that big of a deal in the grand scale. Like why are we allowing very few people to coordinate and destroy someone? To some degree, cancel culture is an ancient sort of thing. You look at Socrates, who was, you know, taken. The human history is mobs destroying someone, right? The greatest stories in history are that. It's it's the psychology of the mob. So Twitter's not entirely new, but the internet, unfortunately, has brought out the worst in some of us. So yes, you got to do the legal aspect to save, you know, your livelihood. But at the same time, we need to have an open discussion, not only about the past, but the reality that very few people are coordinating to destroy people. Angelo Isidoro, host of Cancel This on the Post Millennial, and I'll say survivor of the cancel mob because you're still standing and you're fighting back. Thank you for chatting about this. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening to The Andrew Lawton Show. Support the program by donating to True North at www.tnc.news. <laughs>